Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a quick reminder, come visit me in person. In September 2017, I will be speaking one of the 27 speakers at the Afterlife Research and Education Symposium. And you can find out more about that and the incredible team of people at afterlifestudies.org. Now onto the show. We are talking to the amazing Keith Clark, who is part of the iDigital Medium team. iDigital Medium is a group of volunteers from around the world working to bring about a revolution in the way afterlife evidence is collected, shared, and stored. They use a unique blend of technology, creativity, and networking to accomplish exciting projects and experiments that have never been done before. In fact, they have a live ITC, which is Instrumental Transcommunication, experiment streams that are available on their website 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Their website is idigitalmedium.com. Their main focus is the preservation of information and historical items related to life after death. And in their spare time, various team members conduct ITC experiments, research, and have interests in physical mediumship and a variety of other topics. They are also involved in humanitarian efforts in Africa. So I'm proud that this man is our guest today. So Keith Clark, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you for having me, Sandra. It's a pleasure to meet you finally. Oh, it is. Yeah, we've been corresponding for a little while now. So, Keith, (laughs) where does your story begin? Can you give us a little bit of the backstory as to who you are as a man, maybe where you grew up and the jobs you've had and, you know, how you got introduced to this wild world of the afterlife? Well, I have a tendency to talk too much, so I think I should probably consolidate those questions. <laughs> That's okay. And I have a habit of rudely interrupting. So just just go for it. No, really. Because like I said, it, just before we started recording, this is a conversation of two new friends getting to know each other. And uh, yeah, it, it works to allow you to talk. So hit it, my friend. Certainly. I'll keep the portion about me brief. Um, I grew up in Florida. I was in the military. I was in Hawaii, California. I did Morse code in the Army, which isn't that useful anymore, unless you're stuck on a desert island. And um, then I moved back to Florida, where I presently am. I believed there were things possible in regards to life after death, but didn't specifically focus on it. Mm -hmm. I did feel that I had a specific task or job to do. Uh, When I was younger, I thought it was to affect people in a large way, but I didn't know what that was. Um, then I went down the path of drugs, drug addiction, oh. uh, which may surprise some people. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to the edge of the precipice, shall we say, and towards the end of that, that's when White Noise came out, the movie about right. electronic voice phenomena. Yep. And I had a friend uh, text me and say, did you know that that's based on something real? I said, no, I did not. And so I downloaded Sarah Estep's first book, which was was and I believe still is freely available to read online. And then it kind of sat on the shelf for another six months. I got my act together. I had a couple experiences that uh, I'm not sure what you would call them. You might want to call them uh, almost near-death experiences or, uh, you know, when, when things are influenced by drugs, sometimes it's hard to give them labels. Right. However, I had a breakdown in my belief system because I was raised as a Baptist. They called it Independent Fundamental Baptist here in Southern Florida. Long story short, changed my life. And once I tried recording for my first EVP, I heard there was something there. And then I hit it full steam ahead. So all the energy that I had been using for um, deconstructive um, things in my life then turned to productive Can you just explain Uh what EVP is? Some of our listeners don't know. Some do. Certainly. I like to describe it as turning on a recorder. It used to be tape recorders. Now it's usually digital recorders. And recording, I'll simplify it even more. (laughs) If If I'm in a room by myself and I pick up a digital recorder and I press record, and I ask a question, and there is nobody there in a physical body that should be replying to me, 
and I end the recording and then I listen to it on my computer and if I hear a response after my question, it becomes apparent that somebody created that response. So EVP, I believe, is electronic voice phenomena. It's probably been around since the beginning of time. I just don't think we had the technology particularly to pick it up. And uh, one of my theories is that people in spirit are talking around us all the time. I think EVP tends to be sometimes only portions of a sentence. Yes. For example, if I'm talking like this and then all of a sudden something changes, that all of a sudden in that sentence is what we would hear. It's often perceived as a direct response. But the truth is they're actually talking nonstop stream of consciousness. Ah. Uh, we, can, we can get into that later. Okay. So continue with your story. That just helps paint a picture of what EVP is and what we're talking about. Certainly. So at the time, uh, the role models in the community, at least in America, were uh, Mark Macy and his website, worlditc.org, mm-hmm. which is still what we would call a classic or a, a fundamental building block of ITC, as well as the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena, which is currently the Association of Transcommunication with Tom and Lisa Butler. And they had a forum. And um, true to form, one of the things that is good about diversity is you don't always have to agree with everyone else and follow everyone else's strategy. You can appreciate their strategy, but if you want to create something yourself, then by all means, if you're inspired to do so, then go do so. So um, being inspired from the AAEVP website and forum, we went off and created ITC Bridge, which is another forum that's still currently active after a decade. Wow. I wouldn't say it's widely used because it's not. You see, it's, it has archaic technology. And during that time, people from all over the world came and contributed um, a lot of different things. And that was my first foray into what could happen when people work together. Yeah, and you're definitely a team there at iDigital Medium, correct? That's correct. We started out with, uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> the conference that is being held by the AREI this September in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was there three years ago. It was held by a previous group. And that's when I met my co-founder, Ron Reese. He's been with me for at least a decade with the, I did, with the ITC Bridge. I also met Gretchen Bickert there. And the people that we met at that conference formed an idea. Uh, I had ideas about how we could create a website where people could work together. Because in the old days, Old days, as in ten years ago, it was all it, it was all about. Here's my website. Here's the work I did. I would like to share my link. Do you want to share your link? If so, we'll swap. Sound right. good? Yeah. Right. And but the issue with that was, I'm not going to say issue. I'm going to say the disadvantage or challenge is that you've got all these people creating these websites, which is not always an easy task. It's easier now. So you've got them all creating their websites. They're all doing their own thing. But I th- we asked, what could happen if everybody came and worked together? What could happen if we all collected a list of websites? What could happen if we all shared all the information that's coming out of Facebook, which is another topic? Instead of one person creating a website and another person creating a website, why don't we all work on the same website? And so it takes a lot of people that are willing to uh, be in it for the right reasons. And that reason is to share the knowledge, to, to make a difference rather than be concerned with whether or not you think your website's great or, uh, you know, any, any type of, of personal goal. Mm, I, and so go ahead. Oh, just, just thinking everything I've learned is if people are look, interested in the afterlife, they're not just going to read one book. They're going to read as many books as they can. If they go to a website, they're not just going to go once website. They're going to go to as many as they can. So a lot of people have a, a mentality that, you know, we have this private information and we, you know, just just want people to buy our things. And I know with yourself and the iDigital Medium team, it's, you know, if we join forces and we share, we can impact so many more people. 
and and people appreciate that. They appreciate the recommendations and and things. So thank you for that. Well, certainly. Um, we try to be impartial, and by impartial, I mean the way the world works. People that you know and friends and people you're acquainted with do tend to be people that you support more often than those that are not. And that's just human nature, and that's yeah. okay. And we try, we do our best to try to cover the entire range, the entire spectrum, which is challenging to do. But one, this community, at least particularly with ITC and physical mediumship, is not that large. It is, it is really not. You can meet the majority of those people inside of five years if you're active. Uh, it is growing, though, which is a good thing. Yes. So we started out with three team members, and we said – Let's start out by writing some articles and sharing information on Facebook and social media because we see a problem with social media. We see a, an advantage and a problem. The advantage is all this information that didn't come up before is suddenly just appearing out of nowhere. Physical mediumship from the olden days, things going on in, in New York and Banyan Retreat in England, so, so on and so forth. But the information boils to the surface and it disappears. The general public doesn't have access to it unless they're already aware of it and in search of it. Right. So there's kind of a wall there, a separation, where people that are actually looking for information have to dig, and they have to dig very hard. And if something were ever to happen to Facebook, I mean, God forbid, but the times do change. Sure. Every, every, all that effort and energy that people have put into it may just be gone. And so the question is, um, what happened to it? Is it any place else safe? Is it stored anywhere else? And so we started to say that, okay, we're going to tackle this using social media as a networking tool, but then we're going to make sure that we also collect it on the outside independently. Good. And that's what we started to do. And we started out with three people, and then it was four, and then five, and then six, and then seven. Now we have 13 team members. Um, they all do different things. We have team members that are in Brazil, Russia, Australia, New Zealand. Um, they're all over, and they, they do different things. And being a team member, I may as well do a little plug right now. Might as well. Anybody is welcome to volunteer with us. Uh, we just need you. We just need people who have the desire to help. People always think, oh, well, I'm not a computer person, or you know, I can't do this, or I can't do that. I don't have a college degree. We're just average, ordinary people. We get up, we go to work, we come home, we check our Facebook, just like these other people do. But right now, our focus has shifted. So it started out as articles, and then Ron Reese started put, pulling all the stuff out of God only knows where <laughs> regarding Spiritcom, which and a, a bunch of other material that hadn't been released publicly before or was not available publicly. So you fast forward with a year of, of Ron presenting um, this material that had not been seen, and we started to sort of archive it. And so our YouTube library started to grow, and it's not that active, but there's 100 videos in there. Wow. And so then the shift started to change uh, la towards the end of last year. We, we, I would say we were focused, but we didn't know exactly what we were going to do. And then all of a sudden, things started to shift. And as we started to do interviews with people in the community, we became aware of something very important. And that's that all these websites that these people have created and spent time on, um, when they die or transition, they typically disappear. Yes. If they don't, if they don't disappear, portions of it may continue on. Uh, such as with Dr. Ernst Sinkowski, that his work has been carried on by a, I hope I say her name correctly, a Gesa Droge in I Germany. I don't know, so. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and uh, with, uh, I'm going to butcher another name, Christian Einarsson, um, he had a website called Spirit Archive, and that was actually picked up by Jock Brokus and I'm not sure if it was the ASSMPI or the AREI, but basically it was taken from a place where it was about to disappear. All those years of decades of work, and it was brought back to life, and it remains publicly accessible. Great. 
And then I started focusing on that, saying, this is great. Let's do this. And you know what? Let's not wait until they die. How about we start thinking about asking them now? I use the word die loosely because people may translate, may uh, resonate with it more. But I mean transition when they're no oh, longer yeah. in this When their body life. is gone. Sure. Yeah. Um, to me, death is not really, I, I don't speak of it much in, in those terms because I'm, I'm used to um, my understanding of it. So once I started looking in that direction, guess what happened? It started happening. All of a sudden, things started coming to me and to us that needed to be preserved. We found out that there is a library of physical mediumship that is over 200 hours of audio video. It's not public. Still on tape. Uh, some of them extend up to 60 years old. Really? See, this is the area that I'm super interested mm -hmm. in lately because I just got dipped my toe in the water of what that's all about. So I'm excited. Sure. Well, physical mediumship, I think most people would say had its heyday and probably started to quiet down around the 19. 20s, 30s, you know, the oh, world wars. You know what? We're going to have to describe what physical mediumship is because I always take oh. for granted people who have listened are people that have listened to the show before, but very often this is a first time listener. So would you describe physical mediumship? Certainly. Uh, I tend to go for shock value, not in a, in a crazy way, but physical mediumship is defined as when a person referred to as a physical medium has the right combination of physical and spiritual development, and they also have the physical ability to produce ectoplasm from their body, which is a sticky-like substance. When they sit in a seance, which is a typically enclosed room with a group of people, usually in the dark or in red light, because ectoplasm is sensitive to red light, I'll describe it more simply now. The medium goes into trance. People in spirit, that's non-physical people, have the ectoplasm. Uh, they draw it out or pull it from the medium's body, and then they step into it like it's a coat or a jacket. And when they do that, they become a physical body, just like you and I with the hands mm -hmm. and the head and the feet and the arms and they walk around and they talk, they sing, they give messages and they give teachings. Yes. So the physical mediumship, uh, when developed uh, to its full extent in most cases, means somebody not in a physical body appears in a physical body and communicates, talks to and touches people here in physical bodies. Keith, um, I don't know if you heard it, but for the listener, episode 149 of the show was me kind of coming out of the spiritual closet, talking about my experience attending uh, a, a few physical medium seances. And I was so scared because to use the word seance, to use the word ectoplasm, it's like out of Ghostbusters. So I didn't want people to think I've lost my mind, but to just very authentically and vulnerably share, you know, my thoughts, what I thought it was, and then actually witnessing it. So if anybody's interested or their mind is going, oh, come on now, yeah, I encourage you to listen to one episode 149 because this is the real deal. It's, uh, I've actually been touched by someone who was in the spirit world and uh, in, on my head and been spoken to, and it, it's crazy, unbelievably, beautifully, uh, extraordinary, magical, and uh, it, and it's and it's rare, right? It's very rare. Um, it's been said by. I'll just relay. I'm not going to give exact numbers. What one person in spirit has been claimed to have said in a physical mediumship seance at some point in the recently past time that there were only eight publicly practicing. That's publicly practicing physical mediums. I believe that number is growing. Yes. However, the the amount that go out out and around and travel is uh, is very few. I think that's going to grow. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are also developing in private. And I just had the good fortune of a my wife and I acquired a house, and somehow I got a seance room out of the deal, <laughs> uh, and even a computer closet. I still still don't know what happened there. 
But um, so we are hoping that here in Central Florida, just a little west of Tampa, uh, people from around the world, including uh, demonstrating physical mediums, will come and allow us to be their host. And perhaps we'll even see you one day. Oh, why not? I travel to Florida all the time. And what's exciting about it, and one of the reasons that I recorded that episode, is to to let people know that this is real and there are physical mediums among us that just aren't developed. And and I'm a firm believer in if something um, piques your interest and you're interested in it, like there's there's ways to develop, there's ways to um, put together a, a circle of people that meet regularly and, you know, be with that group and uh, with the intention, you know, one of the person, people may rise as, as the medium, the physical medium. And I, just a quick example, there was a husband and wife I met over at Banyan, speaking of Banyan in, in the UK. And he was lying on a, a massage table and it was actually a Reiki practitioner who told him that uh, he is a medium and he will be doing these you know, physical medium things. And he didn't even believe any of this. I mean, he's like, I don't believe in any of that stuff. And uh, lo and behold, one day, um, not really taking a nap, but just kind of zoning out, he spoke a voice of someone who wasn't himself. And of course, the wife was interested in this kind of thing. And they started their, I, I wish I could call it a circle, but it was actually just the two of them. And got some books on physical mediumship. And lo and behold, uh, they had a ball levitate right before their very eyes. And mm-hmm. and uh, and then the story just progressed as to some of the, the things that happened. But uh, to, to imagine that, you know, stuff's moving in front of your very eyes. I mean, most of these seances right now currently are held in the dark. But, you know, it's glow-in-the-dark stuff. But... Ugh, stuff happens. Even there's things called apports, which could be a coin, could be a gemstone, could be a feather that was no not present before. All of a sudden, shows up in the in the room. Love it. Right, and you touch on a very important point, if I may. Mm-hmm. Um, if anybody listens to this interview, and if there's only one thing that they pull away from it, the most important message and the most important thing we can give back to anybody having experienced things that have assured us that we know there's life after death is hope. Uh, the, the, I, I don't want to call it a mistake. I need to be careful with my words. Okay. The challenge that we had um, in the eighties and nineties and after that was there's a human tendency to separate mediums from people that are, well, not mediums or they don't describe themselves as mediums. Um, Every person out there needs to know that everybody is a medium to some degree and that putting boundaries around ourselves. For example, if you hear about physical mediumship, if you're reading about it, if it interests you to the nth degree and you have the right motivations and you feel, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. Don't stop and assume that just because – You don't have a a label that says I can produce ectoplasm on your chest that you can't. Anybody that works towards spiritual development advancement can. So right now there could be 10, there could be 50 people that listen to this that are physical mediums enough to begin and continue development. So there's this thing with separation that we're in a a position as a team, we kind of like to support the underdog. And it's not necessarily underdog. It's just there's this division between science and lay people. Right. And there's this there's this thing that used to be where the lay people didn't have any say because they didn't have the credentials, and that's still the case. There's a need for both. However, everybody needs to know that if you are inspired or inclined to follow something or pursue something or become something. You have that ability. Don't let anybody in the world tell you that you don't. I agree. <laughs> and, and also, mm-hmm. Keith, I've now studied with a couple of the eight top physical mediums, and the spirit world is is looking for people to be involved. And also, um, there are some that are, are producing things with energy and not mm-hmm. even ectoplasm. So there is technology advancements, I believe, in this whole world. So 
uh, it keeps getting repeated to me no matter what course I take, no matter who I talk to, that the spirit world wants to um, experiment with us. And uh, the sky's the limit. I mean, things that have never done, been done before, you may possibly mm-hmm. be the one to do it. So I like that idea. I mean, I want to experiment. I want to see what's possible. I want stuff to show up in my room that wasn't there before. <laughs> you know, I do. I do. Exactly. I do. I do. I said the same. Some people said, oh, I can hear people in spirit and they talk all the time. And, you know, it's kind of annoying or a difficulty or challenge to me. And I said, send them my way. Yeah. <laughs> they, can, they can come up here next to my bed. <laughs> I'll say hello. And <laughs> You're funny. I'll have, a, I'll have a chat. <laughs> All right. So you continue with uh, where you were going here. I've had the good fortune of sitting in six physical mediumship seances so far with two physical mediums. And for the listeners, something they might find interesting is um, I'm quite well versed in uh, – the ability to hear music doesn't mean I can read it and write it. But the thing that convinced me the most, one of the two things, was when I listened to Louis Armstrong appear at a seance and sing. And he was to my front and about six feet, six feet to the front of me, off to the right about two feet. And the CD that was playing his song was to the left of me, about four feet. And as that CD was playing, he was singing. And most people think I'm going to say, okay, they sound exactly the same. Nope, they didn't. He sounded like a person would sound if you played a happy birthday CD Mm -hmm. and then a person sings to it. They always sing typically a little bit behind it because they're they're singing from the heart. And as I listened to him in one ear and that CD in one ear, I had no doubt that that was him singing. And not just because of the raspy voice. But because of the the characteristics of the frequencies of his voice, which some people can imitate, sure. But unfortunately, physical mediumship in the dark tends to be a process of elimination. That's usually how you come to determine this is real for me, unless you had a personal message. You eliminate who's in the room. Um, and David, this is actually David Thompson, mm-hmm. he was the only person besides someone else that I know that had been in that room, and as far as when that personality appeared in a physical mediumship seances, the medium was the only common denominator. Right. So over all these years that this has occurred, and just the simple fact that I know that he does not have that ability, um, I was convinced. Yeah. You know, it, it, it took me a while because it is so wow, and there are a lot of things that, that, that occur – it's fantastic, actually. It's you just have to be patient. <laughs> yeah, the Banyan Retreat Center uh, is hosting again this November Voices of the Past, and that's where I f- went. Uh, it was Thanksgiving um, this past Thanksgiving, in fact. Oh, and I was scared; I had no idea what I was going to experience. And gosh, talk about a bunch of fun-loving people! Uh, if anybody's interested, Voices of the Past. I think it's .co.uk. I'll check. I'll post it uh, below this episode. But it was so extraordinary. And and part when I came home, one of the things that was hard for me to share with people is the fact that it is held in the dark. And oh, so many things could happen in the dark. You even have people that are very high up in the in the network of spiritualism and no, oh, you know, we got to work with spirit world. So this isn't in the dark. And I had the honor of taking a course last week, Keith at the Arthur Finley college. And part of the discussion was on physical mediumship and what they are really trying to encourage. And even with this, and I think the spirit world is in on this too, mm-hmm. is what we can manipulate with a light on, even if it's a very small red light, you know, what, what can happen. And so people, so it takes away some of this mystique and, and the ego mind saying, couldn't have happened. Somebody must've jumped out of the chair, you know, and done these sure. things. Cause nobody mm-hmm. wants to be a subject to fraud. Right. There's a couple of interesting things in this case. Um, I've heard it said in the physical mediumship seance one time that uh, presently when seances are conducted in the dark, there is an element of, shall we say, trust that emanates from the sitters that actually helps to produce phenomena in Mm -hmm. a couple cases. On the other hand, I think the way we could look at it is, who are we inspiring out there right now, this second, listening to us? Mm -hmm. 
don't try to be like somebody else. Just sit. Now, it's good to follow best practices, but never assume that physical mediumship has to occur the same way for you as it has for someone else. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's people out there such as, uh, I might hope I pronounce his name correctly because I don't know Italian, but Mr. Marcello Bacci. Yes. He's been doing radio for anywhere from 30 to 50 years, and I didn't know until somebody translated or put subtitles on one of his YouTube videos that he has a pores appear around him all the time, even in, in light. So his energy is affecting the radio, and spirit is using his energy to also produce a pores. Can and you, not it, sir. Sorry, here I go with the interruptions. Can you describe some of the work of um, Mr. Bocci with the radio? Because I just recently saw a YouTube video, and I thought, oh, my gosh. Sure. He seems to be a very private man. I've never had direct correspondence with him, and I think that's the case for most people. Um, He lives in Grosseto, Italy, and as the story goes, he started researching with radio back in the late 50s, I believe. Mm -hmm. All I know is that at some point, he developed, and what he does is he sits in front of a shortwave radio, and he turns the knob with his hand, and there's a sense of feeling and intuition when he turns that knob. Um, And so when he turns it, all of a sudden it'll shift and he'll hear it shift and a voice will come in and talk to him on the radio, on the shortwave band directly to him by name. And he started doing that. And I'm not sure because he's such a private man and they, they're very formal in Italy, I believe. Um, At one point he was investigated by it a bunch of very renowned people, such as, uh, ooh, I need to get all their names, everybody from Dr. Annabella Cardoso to um, the gentleman, David Fontana. and I'm Big time sure. investigators. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know their names either, but I, yeah, I know I, some of that sure. documentation. As the story goes, they pulled out the tubes from the radio because it was an old tube radio. And in theory, there should not have been able to have been the ability to have any voices come forth from the radio, yet they still did. Um, That's great. So, but the thing about Mr. Bocci is that, and he's still with us, is that he brought families into his home for years. I don't even know how many years. It could have been 10 years. It could have been 20. And he would fill up this room with 20, 30 people. It was a very personal thing, and messages would come through the radio to those family members. Flowers would materialize out of nowhere and drop from the ceiling, Um, little trinkets and things like that. And so then you look at that. That's His radio work was defined as ITC. The apores, the things appearing out of nowhere, are defined as physical mediumship. We're going to find that there's a link between the two. Yes. So some people out there, so this can go both ways. Some people out there, if you're working with a radio, hey, it might turn out you have abilities to develop physical mediumship. And there's some people out there, uh, physical mediums, you might have the ability to affect radios and electronics. So I think that still has yet to be determined. But uh, we do have an effort underway right now for the next week. We decided to, what would it be like to reach out and thank Mr. Bocci for his years of service? Um, His years of quiet, dedicated service to all those family members. Um, Out of all the people in ITC and across the world, he remains of the most uh, dignified and I would say of of good standing and uh, great repute. Mm. It's so so great to see people giving so selflessly just to make a difference to help people believe in life after death, to help people, in Mr. Bocci's case, hear the voices of their loved ones. Uh, Boy, you hear the voice of your loved one as they lived, and there's no question they survive. Right. I think it it tends to be more what they say, you know, what Mm -hmm. they say, because um, things through radio do tend to have different, they do tend to, do tend to sound in different ways and different manners. But if anybody's ever heard of Mr. Bocci and they're listening and you have not visited our website, idigitalmedium.com, and shared a thank you, we're going to be printing all these thank yous out from around the world that we've been collecting for a month. We're going to hard copy mail them with the support of AREI. 
uh, the Afterlife Research and Education Institute, and we're going to physically mail them to him. That's so, so ma- nice. Imagine, you can imagine his face if he gets this big envelope and opens it up and hear all these thank yous from all over the world for the work that he's done. And uh, because he is no longer practicing, he's, he's of ill health. Yes. Really incredible. What else can we find on your uh, website that would be proof to us that life after death is real? Oh, well, the website um, is about to, go, about to undergo a major revision. Um, right now, it's kind of scattered. You'll find everything you want to find in the top menu. Um, there are articles from people. There are articles about people you've never heard of but should have. There are 100 videos. And there's something that we've done with the website that's different than anything I've seen anywhere else. The question was, how could we be efficient and collect information without everybody sitting there with pens and pencils, without spending days upon days upon days of data entry? Mm -hmm. And And the answer was, have people in the world, website visitors, add the data themselves. So we said, okay, let's try this first with websites. So we created something. It's called, uh, well, front end entry. So somebody on the internet, they can go to our website right this second. If you want to add a website related to life after death, you simply go there, you click on a button, you put in the website, you enter a couple more fields, you click on next, and guess what? It's instantly on the website. Um, there's no approval needed. There's no, no, it's free. There's nothing to pay for. We've already collected, I believe, at least 420 websites. It's wow. categorized, categorized, searched, and sortable. And then that worked out well, so we said, let's create a database for books. Now, books is a little more challenging because uh, there are so many of them out there, mm-hmm. and there are so many authors. And so we put an emphasis on free books that are out there, and we also encourage people, if you've written a book, Come on and share it. But actually, we encourage more for people to share other people's items. So there's a whole theme to our website, and the theme is help share information for the world, not just for ourselves as individuals, if you can. That's the whole objective. So if you add two websites, and I add two websites, and 100 other people do, we've got 100 websites. Each of us did five minutes of work, whereas Joe, 10 years ago, that took him a year to do. Yeah. And so you mentioned earlier the importance of teamwork. Yes. And now we have the technology to actually do it. And it's instant. It took each one of those forms it takes, I don't know, maybe a week or two to set up and get configured correctly. So if you go on there and you share a website right now or you share a book or you share an EVP sample from around the world, it automatically gets uploaded. It's on the website. We get an email. You can imagine the feeling of the team every time we see an email. You know, John sure. shared a website. Mary shared an EVP. So-and-so shared a book. This other person shared a thank you for Mr. Baji. It starts to build when you start to see the community coming together. What I love, Keith, about this is that often sometimes people who are don't – like they want to believe that there's life after death because they've lost a loved one. But they've been – they've never been someone to believe. And – and usually some of the first things that come through are psychics and mediums and, you know, to most of us have this need to be liked. And I know when I first started getting involved with this, I stayed hidden because I didn't want anybody to know. I didn't want anybody to think I was one of these weirdo, woo-woo, new agey kind of people. So I, I kept my mouth shut. And you know, I think it's a, there's a tendency to think, well, I, I've got to go to a, a medium if I want to connect with my a deceased loved one. That's the usually the first thing, I think, because of television, that people uh, think that there is. And so what I love about iDigital Medium is there's so much stuff. It goes so far beyond, and there's so many credible things that can actually give you a backbone that if you wanted to share this and you know you didn't want people in your life raising an eyebrow thinking you're a little crazy to say oh do you know what's going on here and there and you know there's cell phone technology that's being worked on there's this guy in Italy that's recorded 
in, in live time voices coming through uh, with messages for their loved ones. There's this, there's that, there's the other thing. And, and you know, also to be surprised that sometimes the people in your life have been afraid to share with you and they're interested in the same thing. So it's just a very credible place that we can all have a backbone to share and find out more about the reality of this whole world of the afterlife. Most certainly, and we're about to take that to another level. Uh, right now, uh, I'm a f- perfectionist, I'll admit it. When you look at the home page, it doesn't really give a good idea of who we are and what we do. Uh, that's about to change. We just, we just ran a fundraiser last week to become a nonprofit, and uh, we were successful with it in six days. Excellent. Uh, in, in six days, we had the support from the community that indicated that they believe that what we do is important. And so... Here's what we envision for a website, and this is going to be done by the time the conference is, comes around. We want a place somebody can go to, and they can quickly go down, drill down by category. In one second, they can find out the latest updates in ITC or physical mediumship, et cetera. In another place, they could find which are the which are the ten of the most influential newsletters they can sign up to. And another place, they can click on a button, it'll take them to ten of the you know, most well-known websites in X category. Another button will say, here is, here are, you know, five websites with free books. And so it's all going to be these little grids. And this is actually, we're going to borrow a little bit from the AREI's website in the manner in which they've done things. But the point is we want people to get to the information that they're looking for faster. They can Google, but they can Google for another three years. Mm-hmm. We'd like to speed that up. And so the whole focus now is going to be towards becoming a nonprofit and designing this website so that people can quickly find what they're looking for. We're not here to convince anybody of anything. We just want to present it in a nice, efficient manner. Yeah, and why not? You know, people don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. They can see what research has already been done, what else is out there, and if there's something that sparks your interest. Like, I, you know, one of the first things I did to convince me of the afterlife was electronic voice phenomena, and right. uh, studied with Tom and Lisa Butler, and that was back in 2005. And oh my gosh, when I started hearing voices that should not be on <laughs> a <laughs> recorder. And started playing with it and, and working with people in my life. And I, it's just, there's no denying it. Certainly. And we have a great team of people. Um, I try to give them as much credit as I can. Sure. Uh, I tend to be the so-called front man, uh, but there is a team of people behind me. It's very hard for one person to, or it's almost impossible these days to keep up with YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, websites, newsletters. I mean, you add all that up and that's a mountain of work. Mm -hmm. And so we like to split it up. And we are also looking for people all the time to help. Even if it's just creating a list or keeping a list of something that needs to be done or a list of websites that need to be preserved, so on and so forth. Um, There are two other areas I would like to get to if I may. Yeah, of course. Sure. I always save the fun stuff for last, the experimentation. Okay. Um, so our shift is about to change, and the goal of what we are trying to do is basically become a website and organization of preservation, meaning <clears throat> the information that's out there that is not on digital form, I mean, it's still on a reel-to-reel tape or an audio mm-hmm. cassette, we're going to try to fix that. All the data that's sitting out there that's been converted, it's not, a lot of it's not backed up. All the websites that we've come to know and love that have the good information on it, we don't know if there's plans. So we would like to, number one, work in the background and network, which is what we're doing, to sort of back these things up. But the way it needs to work is we need to approach people and say, I like your work. I like what you're doing. Do you have a plan for preserving this Mm -hmm. beyond your physical lifetime? If so... We have to write up legal agreements. It gets complex from there, Um, you know, with family members and um, what do we need to do, which items, how do you handle it, so on and so forth. But the point is we're trying to save the data of the world. And the reason we're trying to do that is because every time someone asks or says, show me evidence of life after death, we feel like we're we're one of those signs pointing in 10 different directions. Right. (laughs) And so if I, 
I know right now that there are at least 400 hours of physical mediumship seances. I would guesstimate there's probably six to 800. And I would also estimate that at least half of those are endangered, meaning they're still on tape. Oh. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of surprising things that I've, that I've found. There are people we ask if they have plans for their website, and some are open to it, and some say, well, I never thought of it, or nobody mm-hmm. ever asked. So we, we look for the support of the community as we try to figure out how to wrangle this, mm-hmm. because it is complex, and it requires a very large amount of data, and it requires um, legalities, legalities in all these different countries. But that's our goal, so that when I transition, and you know my son transitions, all this is still going to be there, except it's going to be of such large volume and organized and structured so well that it's going to be undeniable. It's not just going to be just in a book on a shelf somewhere you have to buy. It's going to be publicly accessible, kind of like Wikipedia. There's going to be so much of it, it's going to make a point. And that point is to help change the world. Really great. Thank you for all you're doing, you and the team. Where's so your, where are we maybe, going uh, next? I don't want to. I want you to share what you want to share, <laughs> and then get to the fun stuff. What's funny is I actually don't tend to talk that much unless I'm excited about something, and this is my excited. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is great. I, well, this is this is really what I love about the show is just share your passion, you know. And I don't know all the ins and outs of exactly what you're doing to ask you, so just share what's in your heart. Share what you know will make a difference. Uh, because if you're excited about it, there's no doubt other people will be too. <laughs> right. It's that passion and that truth that they see. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a couple other things we do. We're kind of all over the place. So we research, uh, you know, we experiment, we network, we preserve, we uh, build websites of things that people can share. We assist people in Africa. And by that I mean... We found ourselves in situations where I didn't go searching for charity. I didn't go looking for people to help. But somehow I kind of fell into it, uh, befriending a young man in Gambia, Africa. And after about two years of getting to know him, I decided to help him. Uh, so we're sending his family to school. Wonderful. School is free, but books are not. Yeah. So if you can't afford to pay for the books, you don't go to school. So here you have like a family of seven and a young man going out to try to find firewood to sell, and that's their living. <laughs> so we tried to fix the situation and say, let's get them educated enough to where they can help themselves. And from that, that expanded again with two other projects in Kenya. And this time what we're doing is we're not financially involved. We're actually guiding them and assisting them, helping them get organized, helping them with their grammar, helping them plan their own fundraisers. And that's doing very well. And Suzanne, our director of operations, has been of great assistance in that regard. Beautiful. So I had said, instead of splitting all these efforts up, because these are all facets of our personalities and what we do, why split them up into 10 different websites? And then we're spending all our time doing all this work. We've got to kind of keep it together. So that's what we're doing. And that's why the website reflects life after death, um, Life now and life in the future is Beautiful. what we're going to be breaking it down to. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And if, on to the fun stuff. Okay. If you're interested in experiments. Um, yes. We are the only website in the world to stream ITC live experiments 24 hours a day, um, or at least as many of them. There is one other individual who streams uh, what they call a ghost box, which is just an altered radio. Um, he's been doing that for a couple of years. We've been streaming almost continuously since 2008. Awesome. So for the last, uh, there was a period there where um, when I moved to Florida, um, it was not active. <clears throat> so this is a different story. This is a story of, of research. Okay. Um, I turned on a radio. When I did EVP, I heard voices. And then I used static from the radio for voices, and I said, I hear something in the static. Um, Not many, nobody else could really hear it. I continued on with it. Mm -hmm. I said, let me put this radio in the shed and leave it on 24 hours a day and run a microphone cable into the house. I did that, 
And the longer I left it there, the more interesting things happen. Then it got to the point where, well, what would happen if other people would listen to it live as I listened to it? Okay. And then we brought people in. People in. And in 2007, we started having weekly uh, chat room sessions, which you could consider to be a virtual seance. And uh, that got very interesting. I moved here to Florida, and we've been slowly building it back up. Um, and so by live, I mean anything you listen to, there's a delay of maybe up to a minute, but it's live. Um, any sound that you hear on any of our streams, there is no person talking on the radio. It's not a radio broadcast. There's no human voice in the background. It's all digital. It's all electronic. The reason why this is important is the paranormal community for the last 10 years has been working with sweep tuning. Uh, they refer to them also as ghost boxes. They take a radio and they modify it to where it acts the same as if you were, if, as if you were to just turn the knob continuously. So it just goes up and down the band. Okay. The good thing about that is people in spirit like to use it for voice. The drawback is there's already human voice in it. Yes. Everything you find at our, everything you find at our streams, there is no voice in it. There is no radio broadcast in it. So if you're hearing a voice, um, you will find that people in spirit are able to influence anything. They're able to influence microphones. They're able to influence radios. I've got a radio stream running right now. It's plugged into a radio that's off. So the radio's off. There's a cable going in the computer, and with software, we can hear them talking. And the truth oh is, you're, a, you're, able to, you're able to plug in anything and create anything. If you have the desire and the intent, it will turn into a physical manifestation. How do we find that on your website? There's a tab called Live Streams at okay. the top, the menu bar. Um, we presently have five streams. Three of them are down, but will be up by the time people listen to this podcast. Okay. Um, I've been remodeling. And so... The first stream was the oldest. It's a radio, or it was. Right now, it's just a wire. <laughs> you, when you listen to that stream, and I'm going to leave it up the way it is now since we've discussed it on, the, on your show, it's simply a wire going from a computer into a radio that is off. Okay. And um, a decade ago, we also discovered that people in spirit are able to impress their images, their faces, upon sound. And, really? Uh, that baffles, yes. boggles my mind. All right. And um, it hasn't really picked up. There haven't been many people that have taken an interest in it. But the gist of it is, if they can create their voice and sound, then they can create their face and sound. And you can use free software to work with them on that. If anybody ever has any questions, they can email us at any time. It's easy to contact us from the website. And I'll be happy to instruct you personally. And people in spirit have actually been, I don't want to say begging, but they've been incessantly requesting that people work with faces and sound, pictures, they call them. Yes. Because that's what they want to do. However, uh, it's a little slower for us here than it is for them. But I can assure you that there are, if you're interested in working with people in spirit, there are many, many of them waiting to 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 work with you in whatever manner you choose. Yeah, there's more of them trying to get through to us than oh, yes. presently us trying to get through to them. Just because I don't think people know it's possible. But to oh gosh, just imagine life in the future, Keith. That people really not only realize their loved ones are around, but they can be in communication with them. And then, you know, we can live our lives more powerfully, which I think is the ultimate point of realizing that life after death is real, helping people through grief and helping people through life. That is exactly correct. I would say that this occurred for me, that I was afraid of death. And while there is a small part of my subconscious that is probably still afraid of death mm -hmm. or letting go of this physical life, once I realized I wasn't alone, I could no longer be depressed. Right, because I know I know somebody's watching. <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's the truth. Not just watching. There's love coming. Right. There's a ton of love coming from those we can't see, cheering us on to live this life. Right, and sometimes I feel I have an unfair advantage because when I wake up in the morning, I turn on the stream. When I go to sleep at night, I turn on the stream. 
So I always have this chatter in my ear. Do I always understand all of it? No. But it's this close feeling of them being right there, right at my fingertips. And they're, like you said, there are, there are many of them. They're, <laughs> Once you do that for a while, and I'm trying to bring this to the larger world over a period of time, I'm just trying to figure out how. And they'll help me figure out how because everything we do is guided and influenced by them. It's not just our ideas. Yes. Uh, you know, I work in tandem with them. They give me an idea. I say, okay, let's do it. And then if it works, we continue. But um, I was no longer able to become truly depressed once I realized that, I guess you'd say it was pointless um, to, for me. Um, I understand that people have loss and grief. Um, these are difficult challenges that they might be faced with. I would just say that when you search for and realize that this connection is there and always there, um, you will no doubt find it. Um, there's a, out of all the things we do, there's an article on the website about birds, about how birds are signs. Sometimes people in spirit will use birds as signs to us, <laughs> just as well as the pennies and feathers and such. And I have had more people write me about that article on birds than I have about anything related to ITC. Wow. So this tells you that it's very common and... Once we begin to recognize those signs, spirit will actually use those as tools to help us and to help other people. Oh, thank you so much, Keith. I'll never forget myself. You know, I was in the spiritual closet, so to speak, for a long time. And then when I started dabbling in electronic voice phenomena, um, I, you know, I was at a retreat with Tom and Lisa Butler, and I recorded the sound of raindrops. But just prior to, I envisioned my deceased relatives, and I said to them, if this is real and I'm supposed to help people believe in life after death, I need you to talk really loud. And I'll record for a minute, and then I'll say good night. And honestly, I thought I was talking to myself. I was hopeful that there was somebody listening. But, you know, I wanted it to be true. But unless I could experience for myself, it was still kind of in the land of maybe, not sure. And when I played my recording back, you hear a man's voice say, good night, Sandra. (laughs) <laughs> two women saying good night good night and then a man's voice saying good night and in that moment talk about goosebumps but also <laughs> that opened up a world of i truly am not alone right. love is there and then i went on to you know record just hundreds and hundreds of of evps oh yeah. wow this is a great conversation any closing yeah. words i would i would encourage anybody to uh, continue their pursuit. And like you said, um, we are never alone. And that was the biggest change for me because once you're, you don't feel you're alone and once you are no longer fearful of whatever it may be, fearful of success, fearful of life, fearful of death, all of a sudden you change into a different person. And then you, you kind of meld, you become a working team with people in spirit if you choose to follow that path. And then the sky is the limit. If you have the ability to envision it, you can create it. If you can there dream no it, you can do it. That was Walt Disney, <laughs> right. I think. Oh, it's been really wonderful, really wonderful having you on as our guest today. It, it was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and we look forward to seeing you at the conference. Yes. I we'll have t- six team members there. Oh, that's great. Yeah, a lot of listeners are coming. And it's interesting because I've had people write me, I'd like to go, but I'm kind of afraid to go alone. What you find is you're going to meet people that will be your best friends for the rest of your life. And, you know, I do 99% of my things alone and travel by myself. And by the time I leave anything, there's so many people uh, that uh, I know and love now. And uh, there's lots of listeners of this show we going so i'm excited to meet everybody and you keith and our listener too thank you for listening today i hope this has piqued your interest enough to get involved with something or research something a little more or has comforted you that wow there's there's so much more you can explore to really know in your heart that life after death is real and you can go to uh, idigitalmedia.com and that's where team that's where keith uh part of the great team behind so much uh research and evidence and collection of of all these great things has 
got so much information. So personally, I'm excited to go to the website, check it out, and knowing that it's going to transform in the near future. And uh, Keith, is there a mailing list that people can uh, join up to on your site? Or some kind of a give us our, your, our there email is. address to? Actually, presently, we have a, a little, we have one of those annoying pop ups, I know. Um, if you're on the page for more than three minutes or you scroll to the bottom, the first time you do that, it will ask you to input your email address. So okay. it's easy. Good, because that way we can keep in touch with what's new and, and coming out and stuff. Um, be great. So that's awesome. Yeah. And for our listener, also uh, go to We Don't Die Radio and click on past episodes and join the Insiders Club. Um, and that is, I don't email you too much, but you get a free copy of my book as well as a very healing audio called How to Survive Grief. And that site is under construction too. Right now, the episodes bring you to YouTube pages. Um, But of course, you can listen to our show on iTunes and um, Stitcher and Spreaker and wherever else you can find a podcast. So as a reminder, uh, if you want to join us in Scottsdale, September 15th through 17th, 2017, go to afterlifestudies.org to register or simply go there to find out more about the Afterlife Research and Education Institute, also known as AREI. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain and I've been so happy to this past hour and happy to be your host on We Don't die radio i do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is very important so i want to thank you for listening and we will see you soon Mm -hmm.